one of the great books of the scripture is the book of the Revelation. It's common these days to preach in the book of Revelation, although the, the word revelation seems to be a contradiction. When I hear some of these messages, I would think it was a book of concealment instead of a book of revelation. It's a book of opening, not a book of closing. A book of making plain, not of making mysterious. I just to lay the groundwork for a few of these things I want to say tonight. The book of Revelation contains no new truth. It actually is an elaboration of plain truths that have been declared by Christ and the apostles. Jesus did not send his apostles out to declare a new message. He said the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance all things he had said. It was Jesus that began to preach the gospel. That's what the Word of God says. He's the one that opened up uh, the, initially the grand redemptive enterprise, and the apostles then elaborated on what he said. They did not proclaim a new and different message. Now, those of you familiar with much of what's said today in the pulpits of the land and over the religious media, are aware, no doubt, that much of the preaching from the book of Revelation doesn't require any other book of the Bible than Revelation. In fact, you could just cut the rest of the Bible out, for the most part. Uh, but we have nothing to do with that sort of an approach at all. The book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. The opening up of His kingdom. Now, the book was written in particular to console and comfort persecuted saints. Of course, that puts it kind of in a mode of being obsolete in our country. Perhaps that's why it's been maligned so much, misrepresented, because we are faced with a body of religious people today that wear the name of Jesus, with whom the world really has very little controversy. In fact, it gets along rather well with them. But in John's day, it was not so. He began his book by saying that he was a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so it's written from the standpoint of one that's in tribulation, that's undergoing the threshing that is involved when the world opposes the people of God. I'm going to take my text in the 12th chapter of Revelation, and uh, for lack of time, just give a very brief overview of this chapter. Now, I contend that this chapter is quite plain, to even the novice in the kingdom of God. And as you read this text, you'll be able to put together pretty well what it's talking about. And I want to uh, exhort you to rely implicitly upon your spiritual intuition. That when you read great texts of Scripture and your spirit seems to know the direction the text is going, it's in order to follow that spiritual intuition and inclination. Uh, it is being dictated, you see, by your understanding of the remainder of Scripture. Now let me read this text in its entirety, and then we will uh, break open the verses. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan was to see with the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, 
which accused him before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as I said, I think that most anyone casually familiar with Scripture can get the general tenor of that text. <laughs> the idea is that God was sending a Savior into the world and the devil didn't like it. And so the devil sought to abort this divine enterprise. This is what the text says. But in spite of his efforts, the Redeemer that was born was caught up to God in heaven out of the devil's reach. The devil consequently becomes angry about this whole situation. But in spite of his anger, he's cast out of heaven. And no more is he found in heaven at all. His accusations cannot be registered anymore in heaven at all. And so consequently, he turns his attention to those that have embraced the man-child has been caught up to heaven. And uh, God has provided however means for her sustenance, even though her Redeemer, who's caught up to God, is not bodily with them. A place is preserved for her, where she's fed and nourished as long as nourishment is required. And the devil fights incessantly uh, to wash away this woman and her seed, but is unsuccessful in his efforts. In a nutshell, what the text is saying, us, saying to us is this, that in spite of the devil and his 100% success rate, God has provided a means of access to spiritual nourishment and deliverance from the face of the serpent. He has provided a way for man to be saved. And the devil cannot undo what God has done. Amen. That's the bottom line Amen. of Revelation 12 chapter. Now I've chosen to call this the apocalyptic gospel. Apocalyptic means that it's couched in figurative language, signs and symbols. Well, the text says that. It says, I saw a great wonder in heaven. One version says, I saw a great sign in heaven. Another version says, I saw a great portent in heaven. That is to say, what he saw was a sensible uh, enactment of a spiritual reality. He saw the tablets of heaven, sort of like a great uh, vision of a great vision span before his senses, a reenactment of the drama of redemption. It was not the sign that was the important thing, it's what the sign revealed that was the important thing. It was not the vision that captured John's attention, but the meaning of the vision that captured his attention. Now, I love this, uh, the way this introduces itself. He sees a woman, normally noted, for frailty and secondariness in Scripture. Not because they are demeaned, but because of the sin of Eve. He saw a woman, but notice what majesty this woman has. Uh, Satan, you remember, brought the human race down by deceiving a woman. And yet the Savior was born of a woman. Made of a woman, Galatians 4, 4 says, made under the law. Don't you see? How God turned the tables, so to speak, on the serpent there. The serpent starts out with a woman, and his demise is through a woman. Mary is called the mother of our Lord. What a glorious, uh, glorious truth. But as I see her, she has such majesty. Here's a woman clothed with the sun, the moon's under her feet, and the stars are used in her crown. Now the sun and the moon and the stars are the highest of the natural creation. Of all creation, this is the acme, the sun, the moon, and the stars. <laughs> Infinity is characterized, characterizes these heavenly bodies, and they somehow seem beyond us. And yet, this woman is clothed with the very best of nature. 
the sun, the moon, and the stars. She is a woman that possesses dominance. She is superior to the natural order. Who is this woman? Well, it's not merely, that's not its intent. He is looking at the entire human race, as it were, particularly those that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as a woman. That is, the Redeemer is going to proceed from the very race that fell. What a remarkable and ingenious plan. That Satan's overcoming is going to be accomplished by a seed of woman. Someone born out of the very race which he has deceived. Humanity, particularly those with faith in God. Now you'll notice once again the origin of the man, Christ Jesus. The humble, his humble origin. He was not born of a political community. Say like Rome. He was not produced to enhance the political structure. This woman was not earthly governments. This woman was not the Grecian Empire with all of its philosophical expertise. In spite of the fact that Socrates and Plato, living somewhere around 400, 300 B.C., were noted for their wisdom and for their philosophical views, Jesus was not born of that nation. It was not, he was not born of a philosophical body. He was not the son of a political body. Nor was he the son of a military body with splendor like, say, Babylon. Instead, he came from a Jewish race that were a group of nobodies. They occupied a little pocket of light in the Roman Empire. Their only significance was their relation to God. Amen. The only thing that makes the Jews significant, the only thing, that makes them significant or has ever made them significant is their relation to God. Amen. You take God out of the picture and they obtain no significance whatsoever. Amen. And this is the body of people through whom Jesus came. Uh, the woman brought forth the man child. I think of this text of scripture that says the gospel is the power of God to the Jew first. That's the lower extremity of the human race. Noted only for identity with God. And also to the Greek. There's the upper end of a humanity. Noted for its reason and philosophy and this sort of thing. And uh, the gospel is the power of God to the entire span of the, of the human race. He was born of a religious people. That is a people cognizant of their God. Now no sooner... Does the uh, imminent birth of the man-child appear, then an enemy appears on the scene. It's another sign, another portent, another wonder appears in heaven. And it's a great red dragon. Something noted for violence and for intrusion. Something seeking its own will. Something that is not subservient whatsoever. Now the woman... The woman speaks of submission to God and this sort of thing. But the great red, red dragon speaks of independence and, and separateness from God and opposition to God. It is, of course, the devil himself. And he appears in order that he might stop the man-child from being born. That's his objective. No doubt, though some four millennia of time had passed, the old serpent recalled that day in Eden's garden when God himself spoke to him and said the seed of woman would bruise his sin. And seeing now that these things were about to take place, the serpent seeks to stop the man-child, which uh, appears itself to be a contradiction. The man, the idea is the son of man, is what Jesus would call a man-child, the son of man from being born. Indeed, this is why Herod made this edict, <coughs> that all the children, two years and under, uh, around Bethlehem should be slaughtered. You'll recall that edict that Herod made. Uh, the scripture tells us that Herod made this because he was concerned about a contemporary and, and a competitive king being born, but that was only as it appeared. Underneath this, this was Satan. Satan was trying to abort the salvation enterprise right there. And all those innocents that died as their weeping was heard up and down the coast there, the Bethlehem coast, as the weeping and crying of mothers who lost their firstborn. This was Satan's heartless, 
heartless uh, uh, strategy to stop Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the seed of the woman, from coming into the world. Now, he too is adorned, uh, not quite like the woman. The woman is adorned with the sun, moon, and stars, showing herself to be superior to nature, but not so with the serpent. He is shrouded with the fading glory of heads and horns and crowns. All of them diminish in their power. Because his attack is subtle, and because he is deceptive, he is depicted as having seven heads. Different approaches, different strategies, but all deceiving, heavy, a heavy type approach, if I might coin that term. And uh, he also has uh, horns, that is, he's going to use intrusive power. He's going to war against uh, the Son of God and against God's uh, purposes. He's, uh, he's not going to actually seek to serve God, but to compete against him. And he has a multiplicity of crowns, which indicates there's no real majesty about him at all. He is uh, found in kingdoms that pass from one hand to another. Unlike Satan, Jesus Christ, kingdom has no end. Amen. It is not given to another. It is an eternal kingdom. Satan's is not. His multiplicity of crowns. Here we are introduced at once to the conflict of heaven and earth. The visible and the invisible, the eternal and the temporal, the religious and the profane. Redemption is not set forth in a moral vacuum, but is put forth in a domain of conflict and of competition. No sooner has God's hand been bared than Satan's head is reared. And this is the way it has always been throughout history and shall be until God calls down the curtain upon time. Paul put it well as he spoke of the inward conflict when he said, When I would do good, evil is present with me. And here we find in Revelation that when God would do the ultimate good, the ultimate evil raised his hoary head. Now this is an influential adversary, however that we face. This is no Nebuchadnezzar, nor Belshazzar, nor Darius, or Cyrus that we face here. That is, this is not like Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, nor like some of those other Chaldean kings, nor Canaanitish kings. This is not like Sion and Og, the king of Bashan. This uh, adversary has had alarming success. He has actually influenced, the scripture says, as high as a third part of the stars. Now this is apocalyptic language to tell us that Satan had in fact influenced a significant number of heavenly personalities. Both Peter and Jude in their epistles tell us about these personalities, so that they are angels that left their first habitation and forsook their first estate. They followed Satan in his insurrection to be above God and to usurp the throne of God. A third part. Now that's a significant part, but it is not the major part. And thank God for that. While there are a significant number of heavenly personalities that were affected by him, not the majority was affected by him. As a matter of fact, so as it was on earth, so it shall be, as it was in heaven, so it shall be upon earth, that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And as influential as Satan has been, God has been more. And we must not overlook this glorious truth. Two-thirds of the angelic host remain holy and would later be used to expel Satan and his diabolical hosts from the heavenly realms. Once influenced, these stars or angelic personages were cast down to earth. No rewards for them. We would do well to learn that from Satan. I see these trite little saves on the t-shirts of young people and there are even some older that wear him. I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Stupid sayings. They are sayings of people that have no understanding. Satan does not reward his servants. God rewards his, but you will note that when they followed Satan, they were still cast out to the earth. They obtained no advantage whatsoever by following him. Now Satan's initial intent is to stop the Messiah. And we understand that he is employing this arsenal of fallen spirits to aid and abet him. 
in this enterprise. In fact, we are told in Scripture that we that follow the Lamb, whithersoever He goeth, are engaging these very spiritual forces. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Now what shall happen now that this uh, great red dragon called elsewhere in Scripture Abaddon and Apollyon, that is to say the destroyer, now that he has reared his head to destroy the woman and uh, her birth, the birth of her child, what shall happen? Well, she brought forth the man-child anyway. Uh, Satan's intent is just glossed over because God is over all. None is able to stay his hand or say, What doest thou? He gives no account of any of his matters. We just take Satan's entire campaign and brush it aside with a simple saying, She brought forth the man-child that was destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Here was the Messiah into whose hands the kingdoms of this world would be given. It is written in Scripture that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. And that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Here is the ruler of the nations and with all of his deceptiveness, with all of his uh, deceit and expertise in persuading people. Satan could not stop this from occurring. Our Lord was born in a lowly manger. He thinks Satan did not even know where it was. And, uh, he was uh, hidden for a while, as it were, from the face of the serpent himself. <coughs> Satan's device is utterly frustrated. Now notice how I just, he just goes straight to the end of Christ's life. An ingenious, uh, ingenious presentation. He was caught up uh, into heaven and to his throne. Amen. Uh, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ put him beyond the sphere of combat. Amen. Jesus Christ now sits enthroned uh, and he's out of the zone of conflict. In fact, while he was in the arena of conflict, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, according to Hebrews 2.14, and he spoiled and robbed and plunged principalities and powers, triumphing over them in his death, as Colossians 2.15 says, and he ascended up beyond the reach of the old serpent. You will notice there is no flood cast up into heaven to wash Jesus off the throne. It's cast upon earth to dislodge uh, saints. Now what, uh, what occurs now that the master has left, you'll recall when Jesus announced to his disciples that he was going to leave, uh, they were very concerned about this. They were very sad prior, prior to Pentecost. They weren't sad about this after Pentecost. Uh, very sad about this because they felt as though an absent Christ, absent in body, was going to be a handicap to them. But in fact it was not a handicap to them. At all, as soon as soon as the captain of the salvation had absented himself bodily, the woman straightway fled into the wilderness. That is to say, she spiritually got away from this present evil world. Or to put it another way, she went without the camp, bearing his reproach. To put it another way, she assumed the posture of strangers and pilgrims. In the world, she immediately got into a place where God had prepared nourishment for her. Amen. Now, the nourishment it says is for a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, uh, it was of sufficient length. It was like this nourishment was like the meal and the oil in the of the widow's time in the prophet Elijah. It did not appear to be much on the surface, but it was sufficient to sustain her during the famine. Amen. Now the point of this text is that while to philosophical minds what we have in Christ does not appear sufficient to sustain the soul, it will sustain us till the conflict is over. Amen. And it does not say it's a thousand two hundred and three score years, but it says days, just to emphasize that the time is short. Amen. And that it is not a long period of time from the vantage point of faith. So the place prepared for her in the wilderness, and it's in the wilderness, it's not in the city. You cannot find a place prepared for you among the masses. It is not there. 
It is in the wilderness. As you step away from this present evil world and away from the multitudes and resort to the place God has prepared, there is where sustenance is had. The time of Christ's bodily absence is one of spiritual famine in the earth. <coughs> While Jesus was here, the multitudes could resort to him that hear his great sermons, hear his great proclamations. But now that he is gone, uh, we must resort to the wilderness. We must come away from earthiness. Simp sustenance simply is not there. Now, were that to register upon the religious masses, Babylon would collapse overnight. I'm sure you are aware of the fact that the majority of things that present themselves as of Christ are non-wilderness things. Amen. They are things that have to do with masses, and great bodies of people, and great successful enterprises, and a lot of money, and a lot of notoriety, and this sort of thing. But in Scripture, it's a wilderness trek that we're taking out there where the earth doesn't think we have advantage, yet we do. Uh, have advantage. Now, immediately the scene is, uh, is changed. As soon as Christ ascends into heaven, and uh, that he has done because he successfully put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, he now enters into heaven with his own blood. Now he makes intercession for the saints, having presented his blood, the blood of remission for the Holy Father. Immediately now, a war breaks out in heaven. Now, Michael and his angels... Not Jesus and his angels. This is a significant point. Amen. Not Jesus and his angels. It's Michael and his angels. Now the angels, as far as we know up to this, are all uh, under Christ. The scripture says, let all the angels of God worship him. And here we read of Michael and his angels. Well, the reason for this is quite simple. Jesus had already overcome Satan. He'd already defeated him. He'd already delivered the mortal brutes. There was no further conflict between Jesus and Satan. Jesus, Jesus won that. Satan lost that skirmish. And uh, here's another interesting thing. Up until this point, Satan uh, had access to heaven. We know this is the case in the book of Job and the book of Zechariah, both of which represent him as being in the heavenly arena, making accusation. But there was no war back then. Michael and his angels didn't fight against the devil back then. How is it that they do now? Well, because back then sin had not been put away. There, are, Even though Satan, the accuser of the brethren, had malice in his heart, there was a basis for accusation until sin had been put away. But once Jesus put sin away by the sacrifice of himself and made an end of it, there was no further basis for accusation. Amen. No one could lay any charge to God's elect. Amen. It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? None could, so the condemner was expelled. Amen. The accuser could no longer reside in the heavenly places. Now, while Satan accused Job to God, he does not accuse you to God because God does not allow such conduct anymore. He accuses brethren here. He's the accuser of the brethren is kept. Excuse you of our brethren, to be precise, is cast down to the earth. He's no longer in heaven. Of course, his place has been taken by an intercessor. Now, we do have someone speaking, all right, to God about us, but it's not an accuser. It's an intercessor. Amen. It's someone pleading our cause. And now, we have a captain in heaven who's captaining our salvation and bringing us to God rather than a threat to our salvation, who's leading us away from God. Now, I find that to be a great, a great consolation. In the language or doctrine of the apostles, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. None at all. We therefore have now peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, so the uh, adversary is cast out of heaven. God will not permit anyone to accuse his people to him anymore. <laughs> now, of course, uh, without getting into this any further, this makes quite serious those that speak against God's people here. Uh, if God does not tolerate it there, what do you think of someone in the body that tries to do this? That's why it's so serious to persecute the people of God. It had been better that a person have a millstone 
hung around his neck and be cast into the deepest sea than to offend one of the least of these Christ's brethren. Uh, the accuser of the brethren has been cast down, cast out of heaven. Yeah. May he be cast out of you too. Mm -hmm. If he's not permitted in heaven, don't have it in there. Now good and evil all through history had grappled but up until Jesus' ascension it appeared as though evil won. Good and evil grappled in the Garden of Eden and evil won. Good and evil grappled with Cain and Abel and evil won. Good and evil grappled in the days of Noah and evil won. Good and evil grappled at the Tower of Babel and evil won. But when good and evil grappled in Jesus Christ, evil lost. And the serpent was cast out of heaven. He was not cast out of the garden, was he? He was not cast out of Cain. He was not cast out of Noah's day or out of Babel. But he was cast out of heaven because the Prince of Glory overcame him. And the scripture puts it this way, neither was his place found any longer in heaven. They did not prevail. And he was cast out by some of the heavenly underlings, Michael and his angels. Amen. How long this war took, I do. I have no idea. I don't suppose it was a, a very long war, although with sufficient duration to make an impression in heaven. Now notice, Satan was not annihilated, he was cast out. Uh, the ultimate judgment God left in his own hands. He shall ultimately be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, but he was not cast into the lake of fire then. Satan is not in hell now, in case you didn't know. Satan is on the earth where we are, walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Amen. That's where he is. Not an island. He comes now to influence men to think incorrectly. That's his great, uh, his great purpose. To get them to think wrongly. This is how he convinced Herod to try and slay the innocents. He got them to think wrongly about Jesus. This is how he got the Jews to crucify Jesus. He got them to think wrongly about Jesus. This is how he got Paul to persecute the church. He got them to think wrongly about Christ and his people. And all through history, every time Satan has been successful, without exception, he has got the people to think wrongly. To focus their thoughts on the incorrect areas. Now, Satan having been expelled from heaven, thank the Lord. That's why when you walk in heavenly places, you're not bothered by the tempter. Amen. There's a response, a heavenly response. Uh, it is not a lament. They do not say how tragic that one of our number has fallen. Satan was once one of their number, you know. He was a shining cherub. They do not say it's too bad, isn't it? As Satan fell like that, think of what he could have been. No, they didn't all lament. There was rejoicing. In fact, it was a loud voice in heaven. They said, now salvation's come. This is what the prophets are prophesying about. This is what God announced in Eden. This is the promise given to Abraham. This is what all the holy prophets were prophesying about. Salvation has come. There's no longer any reason for a person to be condemned. Amen. Sin has been put away. The day of rescue has been achieved. Now notice he says, uh, notice what they say here. Now has come salvation and strength. Strength now is related uh, to this event. What kind of strength is this? This is spiritual strength. Strength for the tempted ones to overcome the tempter. Strength for those that have been taken captive by the devil and his will to recover themselves. From the snare of the devil. And from the very ranks of the people that have been deceived to rise as an army. That are able to expel Satan himself from their own thinking. Casting down imaginations. And every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Eve couldn't do it. Cain couldn't do it. David couldn't do it. But you have done it. Strength has come. Through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great Amen. spiritual strength and, uh, the, and the uh, power of our Christ has come. The, uh, the great authority of Christ is accessible to you. Not only is all power in heaven and earth with him, uh, he is with you even unto the end of the world and the kingdom of our God. It has come.
come to. That is to say, it's been revealed. The kingdom of God has really always been. There was never a time when the kingdom of God did not exist. God has never been without a kingdom. But now it has become apparent. Now to those in Christ, it is apparent that God is. And that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then he looks at the same truth from, from the underside. He says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives under the blood. <coughs> now, Satan is cast out because Satan was cast out of heaven. You can overcome him here. If he wasn't cast out of heaven, you couldn't overcome him here. Not on a consistent basis, at any rate. Satan is preeminently the accuser of the brethren. But with sin put away, he no longer can legally accuse. God does not see the iniquity of his people, and he will not permit testimony against them in his, in his presence. But Satan is not overcome uh, by fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's overcome directly. Now, you've got to see this. Indirectly. He's overcome indirectly. You've got to see this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto the dead. That is to say they were willing to die for this. Now none of them were direct conflict with Satan. They were all indirect. They focused themselves on the correct issues and thus overcame the devil. That is to say they had faith in the blood. Here's a scriptural uh, saying. They had faith in the blood and they confessed with their mouth unto salvation and believed in their heart unto righteousness and they died to this world and that's the secret to overcoming the wicked one Amen. Amen. if you will have faith in the blood and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and bury once and for all yourself to this present evil world and die to it Satan is powerless he's impotent Amen. under those kind of situations Therefore rejoice, O heavens, the scripture says, uh, and you that dwell in them. Uh, everybody else has no ground to rejoice. Amen. Only those in the heavens can rejoice. So you can stand to a carnal church and say, rejoice again. I say rejoice. It's wasted words. Those that don't dwell in heavenly places pretend when they rejoice. Their hand claps and shouts unless they are accompanied by heavenly vision or pretension. Amen. And they're out of order. Is he that dwell in the heavenlies rejoice? Uh, however, the inhabitants of the inhabitants of earth is quite another matter. Both to you and the devils come down to you having great wrath because he knows the times are not notice. Notice. It does not say he has great wrath because he was cast out of heaven. That's not what it says. It does not say he has great wrath because Jesus overcame him. That's not what it says. He has great wrath. Because there's a limitation placed on him. The time is short. See, he has such malice, he's more angry about being given just a short time than he is about being thrust out of heaven. Well, we do well to arm ourselves then. Uh, those inhabiting the lower realms are in worse jeopardy than Job. We read the book of Job, we say, well, I look what he suffered. But now it is more dangerous upon the world than it was in Job's day. It is more dangerous now than it was in Noah's day. Amen. It is more dangerous now than it was in Nebuchadnezzar or Herod or Pilate or Nero's day. Because the devils come down having great wrath. Amen. Because he knows his days are numbered. They're short. Well now what's going to happen? The when the dragon saw he was cast into the earth, it was like he, like he didn't realize it for a moment. It must have been a violent casting down. He suddenly comes to himself. He is a created person. He's not omniscient. And he realizes it's here. And so immediately he sets upon to persecute the people that brought forth the man-child. People of faith. Now, but, uh, but the woman, the redeemed, let's call her the redeemed, they don't engage in combat with the devil. Michael and his angels fought against them, but uh, not them. They fly over them. They're given wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. See, she doesn't 
She doesn't uh, journey on foot through the wilderness like Israel. She flies into the wilderness, into the place of nourishment. Uh, young people sing a song about flying over the enemy. That's actually what happens. You rise up in faith and fly in a, uh, an area where Satan has no power. Now let me uh, draw this rather to a swift conclusion. This is an ambitious text of Scripture, as you can see. Uh, so the serpent, not content with the apparent escape, of the believing ones spews out a flood, uh, hoping to, to to project this flood even into the wilderness where she is to wash her away. Satan's objective is to destroy the faith. That's the ultimate reason for all earthly tumult and turmoil. He's just not here to make trouble. He's here to destroy the faith. Amen. That's what he's here for. And this flood ultimately was his false doctrine, erroneous views, corrupt thinking. Notice what it says. In this uh, flood, the earth helped the woman. Uh, I wish I had a long time to minister on this. This is an extremely sensitive uh, subject for me here. I think in our time, if I may just uh, extract a couple of examples of how the earth has helped the woman. Now, Satan's intent is to reach the godly. But he says the earth absorbed the shock of his blow. I think in our time of some 20 million babies that have been aborted. Now it's wrong. It's vile. It's a satanic ploy. Perhaps some great godly person has been born in our age. I do not know. But the death of these children from the heavenly perspective is the earth helping the woman. The earth has absorbed Satan's shock. These innocent ones. But in the world to come, they shall be recompensed. Amen. God shall God shall set the tables right in the world to come. I think of this plague of AIDS that has extended beyond the Sodomite community and has affected innocent children and innocent older people. Many godly people. We have known of some godly people that have died of AIDS that they contracted uh, through uh, blood transfusion, this sort of thing. Well, what is all of this? This is the earth helping the woman. She has dulled, she has dulled the sword that Satan has against us. And well, all we do, thank God for this. We don't delight in these things. God forbid. But you've got to see it from the heavenly perspective. That were it not for these earthly calamities and, and difficulties that fall upon uh, the just and the unjust alike, we all should have been washed away long ago. And the dragon uh, was in rage, the scripture says, uh, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who are her offspring? Uh, the people that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, you, you must know this of a truth, that if you have, if you keep the commandments of God, and you hide them in your heart, in other words, you have an appetite for them. You want them and you retain them. You don't let them get away from you. If I were to go to one of my children and I said, Now, see, I have this nice pen here. I would like you to keep this pen. Now, not all the children would understand what I meant when I said keep this. Keep it in your position. Don't let it get away from you. Those that keep the commandments of God are those that don't let them get away from them. They hide them in their heart that they might not sin against him. Now, when you're determined to do this, and you, when you determine to have the testimony of Jesus to embrace that good confession, you align yourself against the devil. Amen. He's against you. Amen. From that moment, you ought not to be surprised if trouble breaks out in the home, on the job, in the community. You ought not to be surprised if things begin to go awry, and things begin to go wrong, and things begin to concern you. You should not be surprised. He's making war with the seed of the woman. But well, may you keep the commandments of Jesus, joyfully acknowledging his lordship, and have the testimony of Jesus confessing him without shame before him, not being offended at him. Jesus said, Blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, the scripture says. And in the end, in the end, this very serpent of which we have read shall together with the false prophet and the beast be thrown into the lake of fire. In fact, 
Romans 16, 20 says, The Lord's going to bruise him under our feet. Shortly. We're going to judge the world and judge angels. That's what 1 Corinthians 6 says, and Satan is an angel. He's the angel of the bottomless pit. That's what he's called in Scripture. And we're going to judge him and bruise him under our, under our feet. So until that time, my good uh, brothers and sisters, I admonish you to be steadfast and unmovable always, abiding in the work of the Lord. Amen. Not to be surprised nor stunned at the state of warfare and discontent and agitation that exists in this present evil war, war world. We are in a war zone in which our chief adversary is fierce and angry and has great wrath. He's using floods and clouds and locusts and everything else he can use to destroy the faith of God's elect. But if you hold on your way and walk in the heavenly places, you have this consolation. He has been cast out of the place we inhabit. Amen. In Christ Jesus the Lord. God be praised for it. Amen. Amen.